So, okay, let's just start. Um, today, Adrian and me, Maria, we will be hosting this event. We are part of the core team in DSC Munich. We are actually quite new. Um, right, and today we are, we are joined by Dominika, who will talk about um, functional programming, the fundamentals. And before we go into that, uh, we can just quickly look at the uh, results, like how many people um, have some experience. So as you can see, okay, most of the people use it in practice. But so I assume most of you are from the Technical University of Munich. So I can imagine that all of you like had the uh, lecture um, in the third semester about functional programming. That's cool, that's really cool. Okay, so then let's start. So Dominika, you can take over. Thank you, thank you very much, Maria. Um, right, bear with me a second. Let me just share my screen. Uh, cool, that sharing. I hope everyone can see it. Can I just quick get like a quick yes so so I know? All right, cool. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll sort of say welcome to my talk. Uh, Functional programming fundamentals. Uh, I know I've tricked you with the fun, uh, but I will try and make it interesting. <laughs> uh, before I start, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a software engineer at Comply Advantage, uh, which is a fintech uh, work providing um, transaction monitoring and uh, personal checks for banks and various other financial institutions. Um, I work in sort of large scale data processing, so big data, as you may call it. Um, I'm also an instructor and a black coder and Manchester Codes, where I predominantly teach backend development and, um, and JavaScript. Uh, here are my socials as well, if you want to give me a follow, um, although you might want to wait until the end of the talk to see if it's any good. It's worth it. Oh, and I should probably say um, it's great to speak to um, Munich Uni students. I myself am based in Birmingham in the UK. Uh, so it's nice to reach an international audience, which is cool. Um, okay, let's actually move on to what we're going to cover today. Uh, so I'm hoping to talk a little bit about the different programming paradigms uh, with the focus on functional programming. Uh, I'd like to cover some of the uh, core concepts of functional programming and some of the advantages and disadvantage, disadvantages of using this particular style. Um, having seen the, the results of the poll, there's, I have no worries about, about you being able to follow some of the code, uh, but I try to keep the examples fairly uh, language agnostic and um, relatively simple although a bit of knowledge of JavaScript would help. So before we start talking about what is functional programming, let's just take a step back and look at uh, programming paradigms altogether. So what is a programming paradigm? In a very simple way, it's just the way in which a code is implemented. Uh, so using a particular style uh, makes the code more readable and understandable by other developers. Uh, there are many paradigms out there and you may choose a particular one for your project or you might, your company may choose a particular style uh, so that it suits uh, the company culture or the type of developers they have. I expect you've come across many different uh, programming paradigms already. Uh, so there is imperative uh, and a good example of that is JavaScript and it simply means that the instructions are carried out in order. Um, one that's possibly most commonly taught um, is object-oriented, and that simply involves sort of passing objects around. Uh, Java and C-sharp are really good examples of object-oriented um, programming paradigm. And of course, the subject of this talk, uh, which is functional programming, you may have come across some of the languages already. I hear that a lot of you might have covered Haskell. So that is a strict functional programming language. And uh, you may have also come across Scala, which actually uses a, um, a mixed approach uh, of functional and object-oriented style. Um, I myself have 
um, a couple of years experience of working with Scala, uh, which is what really introduced me to functional programming and uh, its beautiful features. So part of the reason I've decided to do this talk is because, as I've mentioned, I've worked with Scala for a couple of years. And despite working with Scala and functional programming for a couple of years, when people ask me what is functional programming, didn't really have an answer. I was like, eh, I use functions, but didn't quite, didn't quite know how to explain it. So I thought I'd do what every good developer does, and I just Googled it. It was literally like, what is functional programming? And I did the other thing that every good developer does, and it's clicked on the first results that came up. Um, actually, it wasn't Stack Overflow, it was Wikipedia. And this is the, the definition that I found uh, for functional programming, which I'd like to just read out for you. So functional programming is a programming paradigm where programs are constructed by applying and composing functions. It is a declarative programming paradigm in which function definitions are trees of expressions that map values onto other values, rather than a sequence of imperative statements which update the branding state of the program. Okay, so if that made sense to you and you're perfectly happy with this definition, you might probably be a little bit too advanced for this talk. Uh, so if you'd like to take a nap for the next 15 minutes or so, you are more than welcome to. Uh, for everyone else who is a bit confused by this de definition as, as I was when I first read it, and I'm still not 100% on it, despite having delivered this talk a few times, um, Strap in and we'll, we'll talk about some of the fundamental concepts of, of um, functional programming. Unlike some of the other languages, there actually isn't a, an exhaustive list of what the um, fundamental concepts of functional programming are. Um, however, having done some reading and a bit of research, the experts or the functional programming gurus can agree on, on these main five main concepts, and which is why I'd like to cover those. And that's pure functions, immutability, functions as first class citizens, recursion and lazy evaluation. Let's cover each of these in a little bit more detail. And we're going to start with pure functions. So there are two aspects to pure functions. For a function to be pure, it has to be deterministic and have no side effects. What does deterministic actually mean? Well, it simply means that the output should always be the same given the same input. So I have this lovely little function on the slide, uh, which takes an input of X and it returns the input doubled, hence why it's called double me, because we've got to think of good variable name, good function names. Uh, so that's a, that's a simple function. So no, no matter how many times I ran this function with the same input, the output would be the same. So for example, if I pass in a five, I would always get 10. And I could run it 500 times and it always, five times two is always 10. And that's it, that, the, the function is deterministic. That's, that's it for it, uh, that's deterministic. Now, the other thing is a, that this function cannot have any side effects. And you may be asking yourself, well, what's the side effect? Essentially, it's anything that changes the run, the, uh, the state of a, Sorry, not that. Uh, the side effect is anything that isn't an output of the function. Um, so before I explain that in a bit more detail, there is a poll in Slido uh, where you can test your knowledge of side effects uh, based on a very brief definition that I've given you. So if you head over to Slido, uh, there should be a poll for uh, which of the below uh, uh, side effects, uh, printing to a console, amending a variable outside of a function, and writing to a file, or all of the above. Maybe just give everyone a minute to answer. 
I don't think I'll get I'll get the results. So maybe uh, one of the admins, Adrian and Maria, could just shout out what the uh, what the most common answer was before we move on. So up until now, the most people voted for all of the above as side effects. Oh, good, good. I'm glad to hear it. Yes, that is correct. Uh, side effects. Um, interacting with the console is a side effect. If you want to be a good developer and put some console logs or maybe some other logging, um, that is a side effect that technically doesn't have a place in functional programming. Um, if you are interacting with a file, uh, so writing from a file, again, that's a side effect because it's outside of the function. And writing to a variable outside of the function as well. Uh, so perhaps you want to add things to an array. Uh, that's a no uh, because it's outside of the function, so it's a side effect. We can see our function double me is actually a, a pure function. It doesn't have any side effects. It just gives you the value back. Before we move on to the next principle, I would like to just give you a bit of a food for thought. And that's have a think about how easy or how difficult it would be to write a complex function that is pure in its definition. So it's deterministic. It always gives you the same output given the same input, and it doesn't have any side effects. But we'll talk about that in a bit. So have a think about it during the talk. OK, the, the next concept of functional programming is immutability. What immutability means is that data state cannot change once it's created. A standard for loop is actually a very good example of what is not allowed in functional programming. And the reason for that is when you iterate, uh, especially in this particular for loop, you define a variable i and the state of i is mutated every time you iterate. Uh, so you update it. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, or four in this in this particular loop. Uh, instead, a functional approach would be to either use recursion or higher order function. And I will explain what these are in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, but I'd like to give you a code example at this point. So we're going to answer. We're going to solve a very simple problem. Um, I have an array of integers, and all I want to do is I want to return a new array which doubles those integers. I like numbers. Turns out I like doubling numbers as well, hence the previous function. So in a non-functional approach uh, in JavaScript, I would potentially do something like this. Uh, so I would declare a new array. A uh, new empty array, and I would use a for loop to iterate over my existing array, and then push a each integer um, onto the new array. Now, in a functional approach, I would use a high order function, uh, which you might already know what that is, or you might have come across those. I really hope you have. Um, it's a math function, and to achieve the same result, I would declare a new variable and I would map over the my existing array and pass in an anonymous, anonymous function or lambda, uh, which defines what I would like to do with the elements in that array. Uh, note that this, um, that this operation does not mutate the original array. The original array stays the same. Um, what actually happens uh, under the hood is that we create a copy of that array and assign it to the new array. And the results are the same, uh, just in case you didn't believe me, I thought I'd add them to the slides. Um, but you can already see uh, that a defunct over what is essentially four lines of code uh, for the non-functional approach. Uh, it may not make a huge difference here um, because it's a simple example, but when you're working on a, on a large scale project, 
a four line saving or three line saving every every once in a while is actually going to add up pretty quickly. Um, but that's another advantage. <laughs> so I won't talk about too much about that. But this actually leads me quite nicely onto a, a bit of a detour, uh, which is the concept of, re of referential transparency. Uh, ideally, your pure functions should also follow the principle of referential transparency. Those of you that are good at maths may have come across the, uh, the concept before. Um, I won't dwell too much on it uh, because I know that's not everyone's cup of tea. Um, what referential transparency essentially means uh, that your function should be able to be replaced with its value without changing the state of the result of the program. Uh, to explain a bit more in, a, in an example, I've used a simple mathematical equation. Uh, so we've got x. Um, so consider x the result of the program, consider everything in a great box to be a program. And the, uh, the operation in brackets is your function. So if we replace three times four with 12, um, X remains 14, so you can have 12 or three times four. Uh, and that's essentially referential transparency, the, the principle that, the, that your function can be replaced with its value without changing this, the result of the program. Now that seems pretty simple looking at this very simple expression, but actually another thoughtful thought, have a think about how how difficult or how easy it is to write a function like that and how reusable is that function. Next, we're gonna look at um, functions as first class entities. And that simply means uh, that functions can be assigned to variables and constants. They can be passed to other functions as parameters and they can be returned as results in functions. And there is this very special name for functions, uh, which uh, oh, I don't want to go to that yet. So there's a very special name for functions uh, which take other functions as arguments or return uh, functions as the results, and that's high order functions. And that's where our second poll comes in, uh, just to test your knowledge of some higher order functions in JavaScript. I think that is that starting. Yep. So I've got two functions, well, two groups of functions, and give you everyone a minute just to vote on which they think are high order functions. Perhaps if we could get uh, Maria or Adrian read out the results again, that would be great. Here we can maybe may uh, wait a couple of more seconds. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so um, it looks like that 80% of people voted for map filter and reduce. Brilliant. Uh, that is correct. And the reason why I didn't want to go to the next slide, because I've already used map in the immutability slides. And on this slide, under high order function, I wanted to show you how a filter would work. Um, so going back to, so 
as I, as I mentioned, high order functions are functions which take other functions as parameters or return other functions as the result. Um, so a map filter and reduce, uh, they all take a function as a parameter. And I've already shown you how map works. So let me just show you how filter works in JavaScript. Um, so back to my, my favorite array, I, I would now like to return a new array, with, but with just the integers that are larger than five. And in a functional way, I, could, I would use the, the higher order function filter, and I would pass in another lambda function in there, uh, which specifies the condition that I would like applied to those numbers. Uh, so here, uh, I specify that the condition is a number must be larger than five. And that simply uh, returns the new array with those which numbers that fit that condition. And it does not, as I mentioned earlier as well, uh, it doesn't mutate the original array, which complies with the immutability principle. And let's move on to recursion. For those not familiar with recursion, a recursive function is a function that uh, calls itself until a particular condition is met, uh, a little bit like this uh, diagram of the nested dolls. And I have a code snippet of a recursive function, uh, which is actually an example of what a bad recursive function would look like. And the reason for that is that yes, our recursive function calls itself, but there is no condition that would stop it from breaking out of its running state. Uh, so you'll find that this function will run forever, or rather it wouldn't run forever. You'll just find the application runs out of memory very quickly and it's not working. So one way to, to fix this function is to simply um, give it an exit clause. So you could add a simple if statement, say if this condition is met, um, return something. Um, so we'll see an example of that shortly. Uh, what is also worth uh, mentioning that uh, recursion is actually a very good substitute for uh, using for loops in the functional way. It still allows you to iterate over, um, over elements without, without mutating any variables. Right, finally, moving on to the example of a recursion. I'm back to my favorite maths. And this time I have a recursive function that just adds every sub number of a number. Um, so what I'm looking for is I would like to, if I pass in a five, I would like uh, to see an additional five, four, three, two, one, zero, uh, which I think is 15. So how that works in this recursive, recursive function is that I specify my base condition. So if my number is less than, less or equals to zero, I'd like to return zero. Else I would like to add that number to a recursive call. So I would call the function again, but uh, subtract one from that number. So, so it would continue running until the number is zero, at which point it would meet, meet that if condition and return zero. Um, hence the actual, if you were to console log the operation, you'll find that it's five, four, three, two, one. With recursion, you have to be you have to be careful. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you don't define your base case quite right, your your application could run out of memory and die. Uh, to put it mildly, unfortunately for a lot of languages, um, there isn't much support for recursion. So you may not find out your recursive function is wrong until you run your application. However, there are some languages which have tools that help you. Uh, for example, uh, in Scala, if you annotate your function with a at tail recursion annotation, the compiler will actually check for you at compile time if your function is in fact correct 
or that it doesn't run um, forever, which is the best it can do. So the conclusion of recursion is it's a very lazy evaluation. Uh, what lazy evaluation means is that uh, the compiler doesn't evaluate an expression until it's needed, um, which is a great feature uh, and it's really helpful uh, to reduce the runtime and complexity of running algorithms. Um, if you have complex pieces of code, uh, they don't have to be evaluated at the start. Um, they can wait until they are needed. Cool, so we, we've covered our, our five core concepts of functional programming. Now let's have a go at recreating the definition of functional programming. Uh, so I've had a go at writing one and my uh, functional programming definition is that functional programming is a programming paradigm which focuses on using functions as its main driving mechanism. These functions should be pure, deterministic and without any side effects. They must be treated like first class entities uh, and they should avoid state shared state and mutable data. So all the stuff that we covered, I hope that makes a little bit more sense, especially given uh, what, we've, what I've talked about in the last 10 minutes or so. But why would you want to use functional programming? I'm a big fan, so I've got quite a few benefits of using functional programming, definitely more than disadvantages, but on to that in a second. Uh, so for starters, uh, it reduces bags. Uh, so thinking back to the principle um, of pure functions, when you don't have it, when your functions don't have any side effects, it makes them far less likely to introduce any bugs into your prog program because you know exactly what your function does. And Providing that your functions are also deterministic, you know that the output's always going to be the same, given the same input. There's not a lot of space to get things wrong. In theory, no one's perfect. There's still a way. Uh, so back when we talked about pure functions as well, I did ask, ask, I'll give you a bit of uh, a sort of thinking point is how difficult or how easy it is to write a complex function um, that is pure. And the answer is, it's hard. Um, so, and for that reason, in functional programming, the functions tend to be simpler. You have smaller functions that do a smaller chunk and then nicely connect with each other, uh, which leads on to my next point, and is that functional programming improves modularity of your code. Because you have smaller functions, they all connect with each other. And when you have better modularity in your code, um, it allows you to write uh, more tests so you get better co code coverage. Um, for those of you that are familiar with things like TDD, so test driven development and uh, unit testing, it is easier to get a, a better code coverage to write unit tests for the smaller functions that you've got. You can, if your function does one thing at a time, then your unit test tests one thing at a time. It yeah, definitely improves the modularity of your code and the overall test coverage, which is important. Your code will also be more concise in functional programming. We've seen the example under immutability. We've seen the, seen the example of using a for loop to, um, to iterate over an array, over a map. Um, again, that was a very simple example. It's four lines of code against one. But um, as developers, we don't, we like an easy life, or at least I do. Uh, perhaps maybe you like to make your life more difficult. Uh, but reading less lines of code is less headaches. So I can only think of good things for having more concise code. Um, that saying, more concise code is great, um, especially if it's more readable. Uh, so less lines of code means the code is often more readable. Uh, but this is kind of a, a double-sided argument uh, because there is discussion in functional programming about what's, how much 
um, how many keystrokes can you save, uh, which will make your turn your code from super readable, really useful to comprehend to what the hell this is this doing? Um, so there is a bit of a trade off, and I've got an example for you shortly on that as well. Um, recursion in some languages can be faster than looping. It very much depends on the problem, very much depends on the language. Uh, so I don't want to give you um, a specific yes or no, but it can be faster given the right circumstances. Um, and finally, lazy evaluation is brilliant and powerful when loading infrequently used access data. Uh, again, it means that it doesn't have to be evaluated at the start. It can be evaluated when it's needed, uh, thus using up less memory. So those are all the great things about functional programming and why you definitely should use it. Um, maybe you just look at, I want to be fair, so I've got a couple of things of why you may want to avoid it. Oh, I don't know why the slide is so, so weirdly formatted. Um, oh, well. Never mind. Uh, so yeah, the first disadvantage is the point about readability. Um, as I said, there, there is a tendency in functional programming to try and save as many keystrokes as possible, and it can get a little bit confusing. Uh, there is actually a big tendency uh, to chain um, things like map operations or other high order functions. And I've got a good example of that. Um, so back to my trusted arrays, but this time I have two arrays and array of integers and a smaller array of characters uh, of strings in this situation because it's JavaScript. And what I would like to do is I would like to return a new nested array which doubles the numbers and then concatenates the string to the number. Uh, so this is kind of what I want to, this is what it's exactly what I want to return. So it's an array of um, nested arrays with pairs of numbers and, the, and their corresponding letters. So how I could potentially do it in functional programming is using map expressions. And just to clarify, this is an example to show you how um, functional programming and chaining maps can make it less readable. Um, but of course, there are many ways of solving the same problem. Um, so where I would start is I would map over my original array, my array of in integers, and I would uh, times them by two, so I would double them. I would then map over this result and turn my integers to strings. Uh, again, just illustration purposes, perhaps I don't, I don't have to do it. Um, and then I would map over the result of that, and inside of that map, I would map over my second array, so my array of strings, and then concatenate the number to the string. And that would then turn this nested array of arrays with pairs. Um, so it does exactly what you need to do, but if you are, uh, if you if you're new to coding, if you are not um, if you're not familiar with functional programming, if you're not familiar with uh, the concept of sort of nested maps. Uh, this might not look very readable to you. Uh, if you've been dealing with functional programming for a while, you're probably looking at that. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, so uh, there's definitely a bit of a trade off as to what, what is readable, what makes sense, what saves your keystrokes. Perhaps a better way would be to start with progressions. Um, so you've got to bear that. And finally, uh, and probably the biggest disadvantage of functional programming uh, is that it is hard. Um, like I said, at the start, I have been working with functional programming in Scala for a couple of years, and there have certainly been moments in the last six months where I've looked at a piece of code that a colleague has written um, and just wanted to cry. Like, what the hell is this? What does it do? Um, but on the flip side, I've seen some pieces of code uh, that have been like, oh, this is, this is really sleek. It's readable, it makes sense, uh, it's just really smart. And then done the, the annotation, realized that I wrote it, and oh my God, the, the, the sense of accomplishment from that uh, was, yeah, definitely out there. Uh, so it does swing around about uh, in terms of uh, the, um, 
how difficult uh, and how much satisfaction you get from writing in, in a functional way. So that's it for, for this advantage. I did say there was a lot less of those than the advantages uh, because after all, I am a fan. So let's just quickly wrap up. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I can't get rid of this. I don't know why. Uh, it just won't go away. Okay, it did go away, sorry. Okay, so let's wrap up. The What we've covered today is the five concepts of functional programming and that's pure functions. So your functions must be deterministic and have no side effects. Uh, immutability. So once a variable uh, is assigned, it cannot be mutated or changed. Um, functions as first class entities. Uh, so they can be assigned to variables. They can be passed into functions as arguments and can be returned from other functions as a result. And we've covered recursion and covered lazy evaluation. And that is it from now, for, for now, from me. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, in fact, we have some questions. First of all, thank you very much for this insight. I think functional programming is really a topic that most of us heard about, but really don't know what it really is. So I think it's cool to now look at the questions. But first of all, is there anyone who just want to unmute yourself or want to have a, a comment, any remark, any question? I will just enable you or allow you to unmute yourself. So if you want to do so, just open up your mic and shoot out your question directly to Dominica. If that's not the case, I mean, you can do that anytime, just feel free to interrupt me. Uh, if that's not the case, I will quickly jump to Slido and look at the most upvoted questions. Um, so the first one is, and this is the most upvoted in fact, what do you think is the best programming language to get started with functional programming? So just for, for people interested, interested in, in joining this topic or diving deeper into this topic, what do you think is the, the best programming language to really get started or maybe also to, uh, yeah, to, to use a uh, programming, programming language that you already know and which has cool integration of uh, functional programming? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, the great thing about functional programming that is that, um, there are languages that are pure functional and there are languages that support um, functional features without being the full functional, uh, being a full, fully functional programming language. Um, so if you're just looking to get started, I'd say go with your favorite language and, and apply these principles uh, that, that I've covered today. Um, so do try and write your functions that, um, in a, that are pure, uh, play around with uh, some higher order functions. Most languages will have some kind of higher order function. If you are looking for a, a more strict programming language, and I would highly recommend Scala. A uh, big reason for that, it, it mixes functional and, and object-oriented styles. So uh, especially if you are familiar with Java, or C sharp, you'll find it the syntax a little bit easier to follow. You would still be able to write the programs that you like. And the best part about it, it, it runs on the JVM, and you can um, like turn J Java code into Scala code very easily. Uh, so if you're not quite sure how to do stuff, you can sort of write in the Java way, and the compiler will help you to then turn it into a Scala type. Uh, type, yeah, that's, yeah, in a scalar way. So that's a good way to start. Cool, I think there is a follow-up question. Maybe you can just mention one or two more functional programming language. I think at least this is what, what one question uh, is about. It, it says, what functional programming languages exist except from Haskell, which probably most of us know from Tom. Uh, so I think you mentioned Scala already. So is there any anything else? You, you just said it, it's really using existing programming language like also JavaScript already presented. Is there any any other, yeah, just to name name a few of them to to get started? Um, you, I've put him in the spot here. <laughs> uh, I'm not come prepared with an exhaustive list of um, function, functional programming languages. Um, I think, I believe Kotlin is now supporting a lot of functional features. Um, I know that, um, 
Python is actually heading more and more functional, uh, especially in the newest update to Python. I think it's a 3.8 that's coming out. Uh, there are some more functional features. Um, but in terms of other sort of strict um, functional languages, I actually can't think of one off the top of my head. Uh, so sorry, but <laughs> just a bit put on the spot. Uh, but I'm sure that's that's something that uh, uh, that you can Google. I mean, the, the most important thing is you mentioned that already that probably most of the modern languages support functional programming anyway, and you just need to look it up if, for the right approach for your your, your language you 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 use in in your uh, in your career. I think that the, the most important point, right? Yeah, ex exactly. And ultimately, I mean, a lot of these the the languages the the syntax. Um, differ slightly, but actually the, the principles are still the same. All right, there is another uh, follow-up question since you, let's see uh, to what extent we, we can discuss about that. What features do you appreciate about a functional programming language like Scala versus a mixed language like JavaScript? So the focus of, of a full-fledged functional, uh, functional programming language is designed for that probably and a language that just make use of functional programming. Do you think um, there's any difference or any, yeah? Yeah, yeah definitely. So uh, in terms of the, the purely functional uh, languages or languages that are designed for functional programming is that uh, a lot of the, the libraries around them work in a functional way. Um, so you're not having to, uh, like for example, in, in JavaScript, a lot of things is based on some kind of for looping. And if you try and solve an algorithm, uh, you probably have to come up, deal with a loop at some point, whereas that doesn't exist. The, co the same concept doesn't really exist in a, in a functional uh, programming language. So, so, you, so you don't have that those tools, so you have to solve these problems in a functional way. Uh, but also, like I said, the, the libraries that I implemented are there to make these things easier for you. Um, I think the, my, the other, my favorite part about uh, Scala and uh, which is also coming in both in Java and Python is pattern matching. Um, so you can match, uh, it's a, bit, a little bit like switch statements based on uh, data types. Uh, it does make it really powerful uh, when you're dealing with uh, data entries and uh, trans transforming data. Uh, yeah, I recommend having a look. And also pattern matching and recursion, the mix of it just makes it really easy to follow. All right, I think there is a similar question or somewhat related to that. Could you please re repeat the difference between a functional programming or a functional programming function and an object oriented function? Um, so they, well, there, there wouldn't be a, a diff, necessarily a difference in a, in a function. You could have the same function, but the functional programming function would have to be would have to follow the, the principles of uh, immutability, uh, a, be a pure function. Um, so your function shouldn't have any side effects. Uh, it should always return the same outcome uh, given the same input, and your function should not mutate um, any, any variables. So that was, that's the, the functional side of it. And then non-functional, obviously, you can have all these things, and that's not an issue. So do you think we, we can say that a, a function, function a functional programming function is OK for object-oriented, but probably not the other way around automatically? Could we say uh, it like yeah. this? Uh, yeah, exactly. As soon as you start mutating data, you're not actually working in a in a functional way. Um, although, just to make a make a point around this, um, if we happen to think of a, a larger scale application, um, I actually don't think, don't think that you can design a large scale application that doesn't have some kind of side effect. Um, you want logging. You want uh, some kind of alerting. Uh, you may need to interact with a database. You may need to interact with a file. Um, that is is necessary. So, so you can't ever have a purely functional program if it's a large scale application or, or any size size application. Um, 
Another thing that's a side effect is errors or exceptions. An exception is a side effect. So uh, the, the idea behind um, functional programming is that you um, pass all these operations to the very out, outer edges of your application. So anything in the core is functional, it's pure, uh, so no side effects, um, you don't mutate in state. But if you absolutely have to do this stuff and you still work in a functional way, you push it out to the outer edge of the application so that you know, so you're, so almost all your side effects are like contained in the outer layer. Sorry for a bit of a tangent there. All right, so, so I think in general, it is really about thinking what aspects of a large scale application makes, for which aspects it makes most sense to, to apply functional programming. And maybe there's even no way around to, to using traditional or object-oriented approach to handle side effects for, for any common system, right? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite, quite get the question. Uh, I, I was just recapping. So I just, I just thought that, it, it, as you said, it is pr probably not possible to have a full-fledged, uh, full only functional uh, function programming-related application, right? So you... Yeah, it, it, it's probably always about the decision or the trade-off at which area of, of the application you, you will consider functional programming and to make use of it to 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 gain some the benefits you, you mentioned. But probably it's not possible to to uh, design a uh, large-scale application where only without that paradigm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's a good summary of it. All right. Okay. Maybe this answers the question already. Uh, what's the reason to use functional programming before object-oriented? I think you, you answered that already, maybe. Or uh, do you have any further remarks on that? Or, I mean, we probably just. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, the only thing I'd probably add that, like, my favorite thing about it is the, the immutability principle uh, that your data state doesn't change. Uh, so you're not going to, um, yeah, you're not going to introduce any bugs. Um, and also, if you are new to programming, um, I know I did say it's hard to learn functional, but if you learn functional way, um, then you're not really used, losing, uh, you're less likely to make as many mistakes um, and, and like sort of create bugs in your application because you're at least not losing your, um, your sort of your any elements that you, that you have to mutate. Uh, you're always keeping the state the same. You're just kind of moving them along. All right. So I think now we can jump to a more practical or general question. Which advantage, which of the advantages mentioned is most relevant in practice? So I think you have um, this list, this list of benefits, and maybe for some of some of us it's most most interesting. What what's the most yeah, the most beneficial one or the most relevant in practice, why people tend to use uh, functional programming? Um, I would probably say it's it's a mixture um, between um, it's probably a mixture of like the first three that I mentioned. So it's um, that you're less likely to have bugs uh, because your functions always do what they say they will and there is no side effects. Um, the, the second one is that because your functions are simpler, um, your code is more modular and you've got mo more test coverage. Um, I'd say in my daily job, I probably spend more time writing tests than I do actual code. Uh, I try and practice uh, test-driven development as often as possible. So that's, I would write my tests first. I would then write my code and continue iterate at that level. Um, so, and, and, and that ensures that when my application is ready for production, my piece of part of code is ready for production, that I know exactly what it does. I know that I have tests that test every possible running state of the application, or as much as I can. And that gives me a lot more confidence that when it goes into production and is used, uh, that I'm not gonna have a 3 a.m. call uh, telling me that something's wrong and it needs fixing. Uh, so that's, those are the, I say the most important parts of why you would want to use it. <laughs> Sounds good for for developers' life, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and maybe yeah. the, we, have, we have one question before we uh, jump to yeah to the to the last one on Slido. Can you can you recap or what it is? Can can you elaborate on why recursion is related to functional programming? I think you mentioned that on your 
I don't know, key key parts of, of functional programming? Uh, yes, so so the reason uh, why recursion is related to functional programming uh, is because uh, it's a powerful tool uh, to uh, to be able to iterate uh, over elements. Uh, so because there, whilst a high order function has its place, sometimes there is no substitute for having to run loops and loops, uh, and that's. A, a solution to that particular problem in a functional way, hence why um, bringing recursion into this talk. Okay, I think there is one question. The Zoom chat, would functional programming use SM, SM, SIMD instructions or would it compile to multi-threads? I would need you to repeat that question. Okay. <laughs> oh, maybe I can open the chat. Yeah, it's in the Zoom chat. Uh, right, one sec. Um, um, I don't actually know the answer to this. Um, so you can definitely run multi threads with functional programming, uh, that is not an issue at all. Um, I, I have to admit, uh, I do not have a computer science degree and I don't know what you mean by SIMD instructions. <laughs> uh, so actually SIMD is single instructions, multiple data. And that means one instructions uh, do uh, like operations on multiple data. And my question is that better like a uh, functional programming uh, program actually converts to single instruction multiple uh, data or would it uh, like compile to multi-threads that works on uh, different data? So like when you, for example, uh, dot, uh, like multiply each element of array uh, by two, uh, that would like uh, convert to multi-threads or would it uh, convert to like a single instruction, single uh, data or would it convert to single instruction, multiple data? Uh that is a good question, um, which I don't know the answer to. <laughs> Apologies. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure um, what what the other other than if, than a that in factual programming will make a copy of the data. I am I don't know whether it runs uh, on a single multi thread. And maybe this yeah, also depends on the programming language, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I would, I'd be happy to. Uh, to look into that and if you want to connect uh, yeah we could have a chat about it but I don't know it's the, my answer there's also someone writing to the chat I guess SMID is very low level and hardware specific is there any other language than C that has native support for that I'm not sure if you know the answer to that as well uh, I'm afraid not <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but then maybe maybe we can look that up afterwards. So, yeah. Uh, yep. Be, be, like I said, uh, if you wanted to connect, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to to look into it, have a chat about it. Uh, but yeah, can't can't answer that. I'm afraid. Um, but thanks for teaching me the uh, the acronym. That is, yeah, I'm glad I've learned something from today as well. <laughs> That's also cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Definitely. And I think we have one last question on slide about. Uh, uh, yeah, feel free to to add further questions, and I think maybe this is uh, yeah pretty pretty important. Can you please use Can you please name a use case for functional programming uh, for real world example? I think you touched upon that uh, before, but maybe you can I don't know mention any application you know or any really real world examples of applications that made use of functional programming and had huge uh, yeah were really successful. Do you know anything like this or? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so yeah, the reason why I was introduced to functional programming uh, is through uh, my previous role at Sky. I uh, think you guys have Sky TV in Germany. I'm sure, I'm sure it's, yeah, it's one of the territories for Sky. Uh, so I worked in the data department for um, Sky. So um, anything that you do on your TV, so, um, whatever show you click on, even stuff you don't click on gets recorded. Um, and then it's streamed from the data platform that I worked on. Now that whole data platform, which was dealing with 
we're talking uh, millions of requests per second, uh, was all running on, uh, is, is all written in Scala with um, implemented in a functional way. Um, well, a mixture of functional and object oriented with functional principles applied throughout uh, as much as possible. Um, as I mentioned before, it's impossible to have everything that's purely functional. And so say that the, the side effects and non-functional stuff gets pushed onto the outer edges of the applications. But the whole platform, uh, which was made up of a um, number of services, were all written in Scala. Oh, they are, they are still written in Scala. I think that's a really cool practical example and also shows the importance of this topic. So I think, yeah, nice to know that, definitely. Yeah, I think if I could add to that, um, as far as I'm aware, the Spotify systems run on Scala as well. Uh, so if you think about your uh, annual uh, playlist recommendation uh, or your weekly um, new stuff, um, yeah, that's all uh, run on Scala as well. Great. And do you think the reason for that or the, the, the success of Scala is probably the, yeah, the tight it's related to Java, right? It's, it's just Java plus functional programming in the end. Is it like this? Uh, a little bit like that, yes. Um, S simply put, sorry for, sorry for yeah, simplifying yeah, just, things. <laughs> yeah, to simplify, uh, yeah, it would be Java in a more functional way, yes. Okay, but what I just wanted to say, I want to clarify is, this is probably the way why most of the people can adopt that language, right? Because they are somewhat familiar to Java and have some background in that. And then it's easier to stick to something like, like Scala, for example. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, a lot of the, the Scala developers I work with had had a background in, in Java. Uh, yeah. It makes it a bit harder if you don't know Java. Great. All right, I think that is the end of our Q&A session. I mean, if there's anyone who wants to unmute yourself or put any other questions on Slido, Zoom chat, feel free to do so. If that's not the case, or in the meantime, anyway, I can... I would just quickly want to announce our next event. It's on November 30. It's about security, security talk, in fact, with someone from a security engineer from Google. I think this will be, will be pretty interesting. Also, like today, hands-on experiences from someone who's really in, in industry and in practice. And uh, this time, we'll then on November 30, we'll talk about security topics. And I think, yeah, this will be pretty interesting for, for all of us. So feel, feel free to join us on our socials, uh, especially LinkedIn. Twitter, we are also on um, yeah, Twitter, LinkedIn, and our Slack community if you wish to, yeah, to be notified of our upcoming events. And I think that's it from, from my end. Is there anything I forgot, Maria? No, that sounds great. Maybe just to mention that from now on, we will have an event about, again, talks, workshops, um, technical workshops or soft school workshops, maybe even hackathons and CTFs, capture the flag events um, in the future. And each event will happen every two weeks. So yeah, stay tuned to them. Okay, there's one last thing. I think I forgot that. Um, we, will, we will have a post-event survey all, uh, starting from this event. So it would be really cool if you fill that out. It, I think it, it helps to get, to get your, your ideas about upcoming events, your experience with this one today. And I think it helps us to, to, to make better events in the end for you. So we would really appreciate if, if you fill that out and give us feedback. And then hopefully the next events are, are even better in the end. Yeah, that's right. You can even mention topics you would like to hear about and we would contact them, the necessary people. And they can be from any company, for example, from Google, from fan companies, I don't know. So yeah, please participate in the survey. <laughs> All right. If there are no, no questions in the meantime, I think... We can end this session. Yeah, and thanks a lot, Dominica, for the talk. It was really interesting. And it was good to refresh my memories about Haskell because I've forgotten <laughs> the most of the stuff that I've learned like two years ago. All right, then have a nice evening, everyone. I'm not sure, Dominica, if you're still there, uh, if you could hear us. <laughs> okay, that maybe that's not the case. Uh, yeah, anyway, have a nice evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for attending. And yeah, see you for the next event, hopefully. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.